Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Richmond. I'm a cartoonist, characterist, humorous illustrator, uh, mostly known for my work for Mad Magazine. And uh, I, I'm very uh, pleased to be part of this panel here with uh, uh, several other people who know probably a lot more about this than I do, but I'm going to share my experiences. I just recently did a crowdfunding uh, project uh, with um, a fellow madman, Desmond Devlin. And I'm kind of going to share the research that I went into uh, about it, how we approached it, some of the pitfalls that we discovered, and that maybe if you're interested in doing something similar, uh, you'd be able to avoid. But um, a little bit of background, uh, as a cartoonist, I've been a, a professional cartoonist for over 30 years. And uh, as everyone knows, the, the landscape for this business has changed dramatically, and especially in the last decade. Um, self-publishing and uh, producing your own product outside of a third party or second party uh, being your uh, publisher has become something that I think any cartoonist really needs to seriously incorporate into their tool belt. Even if you do do work for other publishers and things like that, uh, this, there's a market out there for this kind of work. People, people are looking for content and if you can figure out a way to deliver that content to people, there's a market for that. There's a place for you to be able to uh, to increase the amount of uh, uh, income you earn based on your uh, creative skills. So uh, to that end, um, I worked for Mad Magazine for 20 years and um, Desmond Devlin, who's the writer on our project, worked for him for over 30 years. But like many things, Mad just very recently uh, within the last uh, year and a half or so stopped publishing new content. So. Uh, Des and I decided, well, we did a lot of movie and TV parodies for the magazine in the last 20 years. So we thought, well, we're going to do our own movie and TV parodies. But like any self-published project, you, you've got to figure out how to get your work in front of people that want to buy it. And that's probably the, the single biggest challenge that you've got in doing uh, self-published um, type of content. So uh, crowdfunding, of course, is, is a very big thing right now. Um, a lot of projects are crowdfunded, and I'm sure everybody's very familiar with how crowdfunding works, but essentially you pitch a product, a project, and you get people that um, back your product financially, and then you produce your project and, and deliver it to all the people that backed it. Um, it sounds simple, but uh, there's a whole lot more to it than that. Um, certainly, that's what we discovered. So Des and I decided to do a, a hardcover book called Claptrap, and it is a collection of 12 movie and movie parodies, and these are all classic movies that uh, Mad never parodied. So things like The Shawshank Redemption and uh, Blade Runner and um, Star Wars, The Last Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker movies that um, probably should have gotten the mad treatment, but for whatever reason fell through the cracks. And we thought we thought it would be uh, something that a lot of people would be interested in, but how to get it out to people, you know, so that they know what's going on. Um, I've built a, a, over the years, I have a blog and a website and I use social media to build an audience, but that audience is, um, you've got to try to get past that audience. So you put it in front of new eyeballs in order to be able to um, really get a lot of readers and hopefully maximize the amount of, uh, of printing you do and, and the um, amount of money that you can make off of a single project. So Des and I decided to look into crowd sharing and there's two, ba two really big platforms, um, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And we went with Indiegogo uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, I think it's really important that, and we wanted to, to create a project that if we didn't reach a certain goal for uh, money, you know, like uh, a backing financing, that we wouldn't do the project because this is an enormous amount of work. It's going to take us a, a whole year to do these 12 parodies. So we over 100 and probably close to 120 pages this book. So it's going to be huge. And we didn't want to approach it where, gee, if we only get, you know, a few bucks and we have to do all this work. Um, we So we set a threshold, but that threshold or that, that goal that you're trying to reach in crowdfunding is a really, really important number. That's what we've, we discovered. And um, you would think that the first thing you do is say, okay, this is how much I would expect to make from this project. So this is how much I want to, you know, to set my goal at. That's, 
not the best kind of thinking for this sort of thing. You, you are now not only the creator, but you're also the publisher, right? So you're taking a risk in producing a product and hoping that it sells enough to be able to pay the creators and all the, all the co costs and, and all the shipping. I mean, you're the distributor and everything. So um, there is a, a, an amount of risk. And I think that it's, it's important to approach a crowdfunding project thinking, I need to take a, a chance on this um, in some way. I can't just set it at X amount of money. And if I get that much, boy, I, I'm paid for everything and all my work and everything's great. Um, you need to set a, a goal where you, you're willing to do it for that amount of money, but it's definitely probably you'd like to get a lot more. So, and the, one of the reasons for that is because the crowdfunding platform itself is a, uh, a great resource for being able to uh, find new readers, find a new, new eyeballs for your project outside of your own little whatever audience that you've managed to build up on your own on social media. And if you are, uh, if you reach your goal quickly enough on these platforms, then they, they, they sort of give you a much more of a spotlight uh, just for regular searches, when people come in and say, what's going on in the comics world today, your project ends up at the top of the list because not only did you reach your goal, but let's say you triple or quadruple or, you know, 10 times what your goal was, that, that's a, those are all sorts of green flags for them, for this project. And then you end up being at the top of their, you know, list of featured things, or maybe even a, a main featured thing. And that can really make a big difference in how many people see your project and and want to contribute to it so that was one thing that we definitely learned as far as actually doing a project now let me quickly show you um our uh project here so this is uh this is our indiegogo uh page right and so uh a video intro is really important you've got to do something visual that really tells people what you're doing and really pitches the project um and your description and everything, what they call your story is also very important. You want to convince people that not only is this going to be a great project product that you're going to create, but you also want to make sure that they realize that you're going to create it. You're going to do it, you know, and follow through. It's probably one of the biggest stumbling blocks for people backing anything on any of these crowdfunding things is that they are concerned that it won't be produced. Um, and that is uh, a major concern. I've backed a few projects that never got produced or came years late, um, and it's very frustrating. Fortunately, Des and I have got a quite a long track record of, of working for Matt and doing this exact kind of work under deadlines. So um, we had, you know, people would have a fair amount of confidence that we'd be able to do it. Um, another thing that we noticed uh, with um, putting together your um, your campaign is the different perk levels. And our campaign has now moved into what's called the in-demand phase. So initially you have a campaign that lasts like 60 days. And at the end of that 60 days, if you've met your goal, uh, then you can continue to um, get people to pre-order it on an in-demand phase, but you can change the kind of perks that you offer at that point. So when you're starting out, uh, some of the perks you offer can be very creative. One of the things that we, uh, we wanted to do right away is have a very low level perk, just an entry type of thing where you get uh, just maybe a digital copy of the book and that's it. Um, and then have different tiers that continuously go up in, in, in uh, the amount of backing that they're giving you until you get to the point where you've got some kind of crazy outrageous, you know, at the very top, uh, um, super backer type thing that's like you'll fly out there and hand deliver the copy and take them out to dinner and dancing or something like that for uh you know some crazy amount of money um if you probably never get anybody to do that right but it's a fun thing and it kind of gives people like oh my gosh well it's suddenly the other tiers don't quite seem so expensive um but we did a lot of creative things like offering to uh one of the original art pages from the book at a tier um, drawing somebody into the book. That was one of our tiers where you, if you uh, contributed at this level, I would draw your caricature as one of the characters in one of these parodies in, in the book. And so so it's fun. It doesn't create any extra work, right, for us. I mean, I, I guess I have to draw an extra caricature of somebody, but I'm going to draw somebody there anyway. So 
it's really a way to creatively increase the kind of um, uh, income and funding that you can get for these things without making it a lot more work or more time consuming on your end. Uh, so, those, so those perks are also very important and having a wide range of them on different things that they can do. And then sharing the work. Uh, when Des and I started doing this, we didn't we didn't launch this thing until we already had the first parody in the can. So we already had done this parody of the Star Wars uh, Rise of Skywalker movie. It was already done so that we were able to instantly share that work with um, backers and show them exactly what they were expecting to get and the fact that we'd already been working on it. So and I think that creates a sense of, um, of confidence that, yeah, you're going to follow through with this project. And then all along, we've been sharing other um, sneak peeks into some of the movies that we're doing. Um, and uh, after the uh, um, the campaign is over, there's another level there that's kind of keeping your backers interested by constantly updating them. Um, every Tuesday, we have an update. And all it is sometimes is just a couple of jokes. And we just say, hey, we're really working on it. Or if we have uh, something we can share, we'll share that. We do question and answers, trying to keep your audience engaged and encourage them to spread the word. You know, that's another thing um, that's really important with um, with uh, crowdfunding. Um, and then the nuts and bolts part of it is something that you should really work out before you get started. Like you should you should understand how much your printing is going to cost you understand what that process is find yourself a printer and get some pricing at different levels of uh, you know how many copies you plan to produce really um i think backers are a lot more confident about backing you if if they think you really know what you're talking about right so you say this is a hardcover book this is the size this is the binding um you know you need to do a little research and legwork for that and probably call some printers and get some uh, quotes and kind of get that all set up ahead of time a lot of printers uh, work um, have done a lot of work with um, crowdfunding type projects where it's it's just a pitch and they know that it's got to you know get to a certain level in order to be real to realize it but they're they're quite I found uh, printers to be quite um, willing to give you quotes even if it's going to be you know six eight nine months down the road they actually do the printing so uh, there's a lot that really goes into it um and then the final part of it is fulfillment you have to take that into effect too i mean you're gonna have to you're gonna have to distribute all this stuff and mail it out um and i think uh some of the people you're going to be talking to provide all these services for you so that's a that's a much better way to go maybe if you don't want to do all the legwork um but des and i we met our goal and and we're doing okay with the backing. Um, one of the things that I think you need to understand too about doing a crowdfunding um, project is the funding that you get from the actual campaign isn't necessarily all the money you're going to make. In fact, it probably isn't anywhere near all the money you're going to make. Uh, and once the once the product is produced, you can overprint and have some some copies that you're able to sell and the closer you get to your print date and when you are able to tell people yes it's in the can and the printer's got it you might see a real increase in the amount of pre-orders because people are a lot more confident about ordering a product that they know is already done and ready to go as opposed to something that still needs many 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 weeks of hard work in order to produce it um so it was a real learning experience this is the first crowdfunding project that i've put together um and uh, it was fun, it was exhausting. Promoting it was exhausting. Uh, you know, we kept on sending out information to all these different um, media outlets and stuff. One of the things we discovered was that a lot of media that are associated with comics and cartooning and, and that sort of thing won't run a story or talk or promote about a, a crowdfunded project for precisely the reason that it's not a real product and they're, they don't want to promote something that they that never gets done. Uh, so we did run into that roadblock a bit, um, but uh, you know it it becomes a kind of organic self sharing sort of thing that just sort of like a snowball rolling down the hill, and gradually gets picks up steam. And hopefully uh, by the end of the campaign, when you ship everything and fulfill everything and do all that, you, you've opened up a new market for yourself and built your audience up as well for possibly another project. So it's it's uh, it's exhausting. It's uh, it takes a lot of uh, work and a lot of legwork and a lot of the stuff that 
pub, you know, publishers and and people used to do for you if you're a professional cartoonist and have have worked with publishers before. But um, it's also a lot of fun and rewarding. And I guess one of the things uh, I like about it is I don't have any art directors telling me what to do. So I get to do whatever I want to do. And hopefully the people that uh, get our project will um, will enjoy it. So um, anyway, I understand that there might be some questions at the end that we'll be able to answer, but I'm going to turn this over to uh, some of the other um, experts here and let them share their thoughts and, and what they uh, their experiences with um, self-publishing and crowdfunding. So, but thanks for having me. All right. So what I want to talk about is how do you fund on day one? Um, how do you get a, a fully funded project, all the money that you're asking for on that first day? And really what it's about is your, your pregame, how you you're leading up to this um, crowdfunding event that you're, that you're going to be doing. And it takes, if you're starting at ground zero, I would, I would start a year out, maybe two years out before this to build up the proper audience to get the kind of numbers that we saw Tom had posted there in his crowd crowdfunding um, uh, for, the, for his book. And same with the kind of numbers I've seen in, in my um, uh, campaigns that I've done, which uh, I've done four now, I think, at about a combined total of $200,000 or more, I think now. Um, and it all comes down to how do you build that audience? Um, I was reading a biography of Walt Disney uh, not too long ago, a couple months ago, and something really struck me. Uh, here's this guy who is building this animation studio from, from essentially nothing. And he's out there, you know, getting the, all the animated films in the movie theaters and he's trying to do merchandise and he's trying to build Disneyland. And what he was always saying was, we don't make movies to make money. We make money so we can make more movies. And that was always his primary goal was to, to make more creative projects, Disneyland, the movies, everything that he kind of had his, his fingers in were to make these these projects that are timeless. I mean, you still watch Pinocchio and 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 Snow White and um, Sleeping Beauty, and they they just have this timeless quality about them. But money has, was always a problem for Walt Disney. He was always going back to Roy and saying, you know, do we have enough money to do this project? How can we do this? How can we do that? And he had a brilliant solution for how to fund Disneyland. He had already mortgaged vacation homes he was paying for the thing himself and and i'm telling this story because it, it does have a point i'm i didn't just want to talk about walt disney but uh, what he did was he went to abc and said and they'd been hounding him can you do a tv show for us tv was this new frontier right um can you do a tv show and he realized and this was like kind of a genius thing if i did a weekly tv show um you know, the wonderful world of Walt Disney, I could get money from ABC to help pay for these projects. But the side benefit from that was instead of a person having to go to a movie theater to see a Walt Disney production, they were now just turning on the TV every week and seeing it in their home. And so he was essentially broadening the, the Walt Disney fan base, unlike he had ever done before. And that's where I think Disney was already really popular, but that's where it really started to pop and people wanted to go to Disneyland and they wanted to know more about Walt Disney and they wanted to become Imagineers and become animators and things like that. It's really became a household name. So how does that apply to us? And what I realized was as a creator, you're not just the person making your comic. You also need to be the person doing the wonderful world of Walt Disney, that weekly show that essentially talks about everything you're doing over here and is hopefully um, a vehicle to fund the things that you wanna do. So how do you become like your own, um, I guess, production company that can market and also um, create the, 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 the work that you wanna create? That's what I, that's what I wanna, wanna zero in on today. First thing I wanna talk about, and this is your number one priority when it comes to marketing and making comics and, and 
kind of wearing all these hats as an independent creator, your number one priority, and never forget this, is you have to make comics. You can't, you can't let yourself um, put the cart in front of the horse and spend your day so focused on marketing that you neglect making your book. Okay, so first priority, get that book made, spend your first few hours of the day working on that thing, and then devote time to the to your marketing eff efforts afterwards. And I only say this because sometimes I forget which is more important. And you look at the social media numbers and you see the interaction and the engagement and, you, and, and, and it, it almost tricks you into thinking you have more of an audience and a following than you actually do. And you lean into that and you create for that when really the thing that, that, that people care about and that, that has the longevity is the work, the comics that you're making. So number one, make the comics. So that's priority number one. Priority number two is I want you to forget social media at this point. I want you to just think about acquiring email addresses. And the reason for that is email is the number one most used social media. Everybody has an email account and they check it, they check in on it daily. Um, they might check um, Instagram, they might check TikTok, they might go to YouTube um, and they'll come and go on those things. But everybody's in their e inbox daily. And so you want to be where the eyeballs are. You want to be in their inbox. So you have to um, have access to these people's, these people's emails. What's nice about email is it's sort of um, an, an email is giving people when you give someone's email, you're almost giving them permission to engage with you on that level. It's a little bit more of a commitment than just clicking follow. Um, it, 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 I think you have a, a stronger fan who's given you an email than just someone who's, who's given you a follow. And I want to show you an example here of something. Let's find my right desktop here. So this is um, a blank page, but I want to show you this thing I posted on, on Instagram, I have half a million Instagram followers, which is, that's crazy. It seems like a ton of Instagram followers. And I posted this picture of a TikTok robot and it got 53,000 likes. And, and I look at that and I'm like, holy cow, that's, that is incredible because usually I'm getting 10,000 likes on something. That tells you a lot about social media right there to have half a million followers and only get 10,000 likes on something. This is a conversion rate of a few percentage points, but to get 53%, that, that's really good. And, and, and I was happy with that, but let's view the insights. Let's dig, a, dig in a little deeper. Okay. So the reach was 454,000. That's almost all of my followers, uh, but it wasn't just my followers. Out of those almost half a million accounts that were reached, um, 7,000 visited my profile. Now that's pretty cool. If I had a link to buy my new book, those 7,000 people would then be have access to this link on Instagram where they could go check out my book. Um, actually, right now, my Instagram account just said sign up for my, for my newsletter. But let's go down here. Profile visits 7,600, website clicks 31. Cue uh, the price is right trumpet, <laughs> you know, like out of half a million people, 31 people clicked to see my website. Um, okay, this is for a 50,000 uh, liked post. Let's look at an actual normal post. So here's my personal character, Skull Chaser. I'm supposed to be making a comic with them someday. Life gets in the way. That's that's <laughs> that's something that I'm struggling with right now. But I keep posting. I keep writing stories for them, and that'll be a thing that happens someday. It got six thousand likes, or almost seven thousand likes, and that is more in the realm of of these are like more of my fans and not just people who think the the TikTok robot is a crazy idea. And let's look at the uh, the the reach there. So sixty two thousand reach. 400 profile visits still, those are great numbers, but then website clicks, six, six clicks from that. So that is social media. Now I wanna show you my, uh, my last email newsletter I sent out, which was Rise of the App Bots. I've, um, I shared my TikTok bot and a bunch of these other robots. And every week I not, not only share 
uh, what I've been working on, but I share what's inspiring me. So look at this cool art this artist make, look at this cool car I saw, you know, on Twitter or whatever. So I'm trying to give value, but this goes out to 86, uh, 8,600 people, 8,600 people, 43% of them open the email. That's, that's really good. So that's almost half of these people and a 5.2% click rate. Okay, so let's go down. Here's my shop. I have a link to my shop here. 59 subscribers clicked a link to check out my shop. Um, so out of 8,000 people, I got the same amount of people clicking on my shop that I got from the um, uh, this Instagram post. I got more people visiting my shop than I got people visiting my website here with a fraction of them. So this is just to illustrate to you how important email is and how you can get so much better engagement with um, a small email list compared to a massive amount of followers on YouTube and, and Instagram and, and things like that. Okay. So going down to my list, priority one, make your comics. Priority two, acquire the email addresses. How do you, let me stop sharing here. How do you acquire email addresses? Um, one of the best ways I've seen it is if we ever go back to actual physical cons, you have your table there and you just have a piece of paper and it says, hey, if you want to uh, subscribe to my newsletter, put your email here. Anytime I come out with a new book, you'll be first to know. Um, anytime I have a special sale or a deal, you'll be the first to know. And that's already an interaction. Uh, uh, you're already engaging with the people on a, um, on a level where they're willing to be more than just a fan, but, but a customer. Okay. So those emails that you get from cons have a very uh, high open rate, a very high engagement rate. The next thing you do is any, if you have an online shop and you're already selling books online, what you're going to do is um, get the emails from people who have bought stuff. And usually there's a little check, you know, yes, I want to receive uh, emails from, from this person. So those emails, you, you put them into your uh, email marketing uh, uh, app. And then the other thing that's really nice to do is you just go on your social media accounts and, and what you do is you just say, I've got a, a free giveaway. Um, all you got to do is essentially exchange your email or give me your email and then I'll, I'll send it to you. And it's usually a digital thing. It might be um, a PDF of a chapter of your book. So if like, if I was Tom, what I would do is take one of those chapters like the star wars one or the shawshank redemption one and just that have that be its own self-contained thing that you maybe are selling for five dollars on as a pdf or twenty dollars or whatever on a pdf on your website but they get it for free when they subscribe to you you get a lot of um a lot of emails that way and they're good emails because these are people who are telling you i'm interested in the thing that you're selling okay so that is number two. Number three, once you've got all these emails, your next priority is to market to these people. And marketing's like maybe a bad word or not, but essentially I look at it as you start building a relationship with these people. So I use ConvertKit as my email marketing software. It's free to use for the first 1,000 subscribers. Um, and after that, it's I think it starts at like $25 a month. You easily... It easily pays for itself. Anytime you launch anything, um, it's well well worth it because these people are primed and ready to back your project or support your next book or something. I send out an email every week. Um, and these emails are all they are is here's what I've been working on. So going back to step one, make your comic, be producing a thing. And that should give you enough content to share with people what you've been working on that week. But share what you're working on share your thoughts about what's going on um, in the world and how it applies to your art, um, share what inspires you. The main thing is make it short, make it sweet, make it valuable to them so that when they open the email, they're, they're grateful that they opened it. They got something from, from it. Um, what's great about that is even if they don't open it, they still, they still have to enter, engage with that email at some level in their inbox. So they're, so they're reminded of you every week. They either need to put it in a folder or delete it or open it. So at some point they have to, they have to deal with you. So that's always keeping them in your mind. And, and in this world of distractions and people looking at 
and so many different things all day to be reminded about someone is, is very valuable. Uh, but the most important thing is as people are opening these emails and as they're reading it, and I see this every week, I get replies saying, I love your newsletter. It's, it's, um, it's one of the, you know, it's the thing I look forward to every day. I don't get that from um, anything other than emails and maybe YouTube videos, because I try to offer value in YouTube videos. So you really build this relationship. Okay. So just to review, you make your comic priority one, number two, acquire emails. Uh, number three, engage and build a relationship with the people through your email list. And number four is now you go to your social media and you use social media to kind of cast a wider net and to pe bring people into this uh, sort of fold of people who are, who are subscribed to your emails. With social media, my advice is pick one and go all in on that. And once you're there and, you, and you're doing it and you've got like your first 10,000 followers, branch out and then you can do your other social medias. Pick the social media that best suits you. If you're very engaging, you've got a nice face or you have a great way that you talk or look at things, do anything with video. So TikTok or, or YouTube or Instagram stories and, and reels, those types of things have a high engagement rate. If you're very good at, you know, we're all artists here or writers, very good at, 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 something visual, then Instagram's good for that. If you're funny and you're, you're good at quips, Twitter might be your thing, right? So just look at all these. The other thing is um, with video and with audio, like podcasts, those uh, are ways to really have people get to know you, the artist. A podcast is 30 minutes to an hour of them just listening to your voice. And so if you just do a podcast that talks about, you know, maybe you make comics like mad comics, like what Tom, Tom does. And your podcast is just like, we're going to read through this issue of 1985 may of mad comics. And I'm just going to tell you everything that uh, is cool and inspires me about this. I think comics kayfabe kind of does that thing. If you've seen that YouTube channel, it's great. It's brilliant. And everybody wants to kind of know what a pro thinks about what other people are doing and, and see their opinions. So that gets them endeared to you. And then they want to see what kind of work you make and what your next project is going to be. Um, the last thing is you can edit and repurpose that stuff um, into smaller formats. So if you have a long podcast episode, if you have a long YouTube video, cut out clips and those can be a little TikTok thing or part of your story, Instagram story or something like that. Um, last thing with social media is there's Facebook groups and there's discords. And these are very concentrated focus groups of people who like a specific thing. So if you're into, I keep going back to Tom, but it's such a good example. If you're into movies, go join five movie Facebook groups and start posting you know, follow the rules, but post your, your artwork in there and people will love it because they're already into film and they're going to be into, you know, these cool like movie caricatures that you're doing. And, uh, and it just, it, it's just a very focused thing instead of like trying to grab random people on, on Instagram through like, you know, people searching or, or people, um, you know, following hashtags or things like that. So that's all I had to say about this pregame. Give yourself, if you're already established on, on certain levels, give yourself six months to kind of build this email list and, and, and weekly do it. If you're starting ground zero, give yourself a year or two years. Again, make your comics, um, acquire email lists, build that uh, relationship with them through email, and then use social media to bring people back into that. That's all I got. Hi, everybody. We're probably not going to be as polished as what you just heard, uh, but my name is Jordan Plosky. Beside me is Eric Moss. We are the co-founders of Zoop. And you may be asking yourself, what is Zoop? Uh, in the world of crowdfunding, you guys are probably very familiar with Kickstarter and Indiegogo, as uh, Tom was mentioning uh, earlier uh, during his part of this. Zoop, we are a new entrant in the crowdfunding space. We have a focus specifically on comics. We're going to try to tell you a little bit about Zoop a little bit about our history with crowdfunding without this sounding too much of like a sales pitch. That's not what this is intended to be. But as great as uh, crowdfunding is, as useful as a tool as it is, you know, it, it, it came into the picture roughly 9, 10, 11 years ago, something like that, with Kickstarter and Indiegogo, not necessarily with comics in mind. 
So during the pandemic, uh, you know, Eric and I have known each other for a few years. Um, you know, I guess Eric, we should maybe say a little bit about our backgrounds and how we connected and, and how this all how this all came to be. Um, but before uh, the two of us formed Zoop, I actually had another startup uh, called Comic Blitz. It was like Netflix for digital comics or for people watching this. If you know Comixology Unlimited, we were sort of a competitor to that. Um, we wound up selling that company to a video streaming distribution service a couple of years ago. But during that time, uh, Eric uh, was my counterpart at IDW and I would license content from him. Um, I'm taking up all this time, but Eric, you know, tell the people a little bit about yourself as well. Yeah, no, I, um, I ran biz dev for IDW for three years and, um, you know, we were always looking for new ways to engage and get in front of customers. And there was already the direct market, the mass market. They had just signed, um, Penguin Random House as a distributor, uh, and crowdfunding was very new to them. Um, Really, they had only dipped their toes in it in the games space, but never for comics. Um, so I really I wanted to make some kind of breakthrough, and so really dove into the crowdfunding world and had it, you know, a, a kind of my my own project that I pushed through and uh, just learned everything about in the process, how to get a campaign successful, um, how to promote it, and how to do all those things. Um, after my time at IDW t came to a close, I can just continued with the crowdfunding uh, theme and was doing consulting and, um, you know, was part of, I was a project manager for a few projects, uh, uh, notably uh, Boom's Berserker uh, campaign with Keanu Reeves. And so it was just trial by fire. I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm, I'm like a sponge. I'm picking up all these tips and tricks. And all the while, I'm talking to Jordan about, all right, what's next? What is needed uh, in the comic industry? Um, and really, the pandemic uh, really shined a light on a big need, I'd say, for creators to, need to get some help um, to run these campaigns, um, because a lot of projects were just left in limbo. Um, so I was talking to a bunch of them. Jordan's talking to a bunch of them. Do we help them on existing platforms um, like Kickstarter? Or do we maybe think about doing something on our own and filling some new needs and have a new type of interface that we thought was sorely needed because there was not much innovation over the past decade? And so that's where Zoop came to light. Yeah. Yeah. And realistically, crowdfunding is amazing. But after listening, you know, to Tom and Jake talk, it's very time consuming, right? Now, all of a sudden, you're not just a creator, you're your own publisher, you're, you're your own marketing person, you you have taken on more than more work than you've ever taken on in your life to bring to market potentially, you know, a comic graphic novel, whatever your project is, that you're not even sure if it's going to get funded or not, right? So this is a, a an extensive amount of time, you're maybe potentially learning how to, you know, use this platform, right? Because the first time maybe you look at a Kickstarter and Indiegogo, it, it's not so intuitive that it takes you, you know, 15 minutes to put together a campaign. That's not the case. And then at the same time, a lot of creators are either working in the industry potentially and have work for hire stuff or freelance work that they have to focus on, or you have your own day job, which has nothing to do with comics. It's just what's paying the bills. And you might, you might not have the time, you know, to establish an email list, like Jake was saying, or, you know, to put together this, this entire campaign. So what Zoop kind of did is we looked at what was out there right now and Kickstarter and Indiegogo are great, but it's kind of like your dad giving you the keys to a car and saying, here you go, kid, figure it out. Right. And that and we kind of started listing like all these things that were missing from the world of crowdfunding. What would make it easier? What would make it more efficient? And that's where Zoop came in. Um, again, I'm trying not to make this like a pit, you know, like a, a, a sales pitch for Zoop um, because we're a small team and but basically we're a concierge service. We're not running on Kickstarter. We're not running on Indiegogo. We have our own platform that's live now. Uh, it's at Zoop.gg as in good game, because even though we're starting with and focused on comics right now, we are going to be expanding into other categories like gaming and even high-end collectibles, sort of like Hasbro Pulse, if anybody here is familiar with that pre-order system um, and things like that. 
Now back to the, the fact that we found a bunch of pain points, a bunch of holes in the model for crowdfunding. That's that's kind of what we do is, is we are looking to fill in those holes and be a turnkey solution for creators who are looking to crowdfund uh, their comics. I have a, a little deck here, just, just, just so you're not busy staring at our two faces this whole time. Maybe this will make it a little bit more interesting. Um, but let's check out Nosferatu here, right? Yeah. He, he's kind of letting you know there's a lot of evil in crowdfunding right now, right? There's a lot that crowdfunding doesn't offer, right? And what it really boils down to is it takes a, a lot of time, a lot of learning, and it, it's very difficult to get the visibility that you're looking for potentially on Indiegogo or Kickstarter. There are literally, I think that the number was around 1,500 comic Kickstarters each month. And that doesn't even go into, you know, take into account the amount of comics that hit the direct market each month, which is, I think, you know, maybe like 600 or so. So now you're competing with like 2,100 other comics that are out there right now. How do you get that visibility? And again, you know, to some of the points that were brought up earlier, it takes a long time to prepare for a campaign like this. And when you are running it in the middle of it, it's a full-time job. You know, we, we've heard from creators who, who we've worked with that like, yeah, they can't focus on creating their next project. They can't draw any more pages. They can't write anymore. They're literally busy, like all, almost all day, every day, running their campaign, answering comments, talking to people, communicating. So that's just something else that Zoop does that we saw is like, wow, this isn't really scalable for people for most people rather it's not you know crowdfunding a lot of people who do it once are very scared to come back and do it again because of their experience and it there's there's a little bit of that barrier to entry for a lot of people who see it as oh my god this is so cumbersome and it's like i don't even know where to get started so with zoop we come in rather heroically as you can see and we try to solve as many of those pain points as we possibly can. We want to be that one-stop shop that gives you all the services necessary on the platform, right? So because a lot of people potentially will look for a campaign manager, right? If, 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 if you have a full-time job, you have some other gigs or freelance work that you're doing, but you have this project that you want to get out there and you say, look, I'm a creator. I am not a business person. I'm not a publisher. I, I don't want to handle the technology or the administrative stuff with this. I'm going to find some people. Well, now, now it takes you weeks, potentially months of crewing up and putting together a team of people. And that might be a campaign manager, someone to handle marketing for you. If you yourself don't have what it takes, and there's no shame in that, not everybody is built to handle every aspect of getting a product to market, you know, and then during the campaign, again, is another full-time job. But then a lot of, a lot of, you know, the place where a lot of projects potentially fall apart is after the campaign is done. You know, I think Tom uh, mentioned earlier, just because you maybe potentially earn, let's, let's call it $50,000 on a campaign, that's not $50,000 in your pocket. You yourself are responsible for the expenses of printing that comic. And not only that, you need to fulfill that comic. And we've probably all heard horror stories of projects that have it taken a year and a half, two years to be fulfilled, or if you're Rob Liefeld, just never fulfilling, right? You don't, you don't want to be that person that doesn't fulfill a campaign because if you are, nobody will ever back the next campaign you do. You destroy all credibility and people are like, well, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. Whatever George Bush said, you're not going to fool me again, right? So you don't want to toy with people. You, you need to establish trust just like a company would in that, hey, I have this product. You have given me your money. I've earned your trust by delivering this product. If you're a creator, you might not know even how to begin to fulfill. Do I do it myself? Do I find someone else to do it for me? If I do it myself, what kind of packaging materials do I need? Do I need to use uh, US Postal Service or am I going to go through UPS, FedEx? And all of this takes a really long amount of time to figure it out on your own, right? There are potentially services out there that you can go to that help you with all this and tack on to a Kickstarter or um, an Indiegogo, but it also takes time to find those people and to vet those people and to negotiate with them and figure it all out. I know if you're a creator and if, if you're focused on writing and drawing, these are things that you do not want to worry about. You don't want to take time with. You don't want to even have to oversee it. 
right? Even just managing a team of people is also time consuming and takes a lot of work. One of the cool things that we pride ourselves on with Zoop is that we don't get paid unless the campaign reaches its goal. And in that regard, we're very much like a Kickstarter. It's an all or nothing platform. And that incentivizes us to work hard for our clients who are on Zoop. And it also should give our clients peace of mind in that they don't have to spend any time overseeing us, knowing that we're incentivized on our own, that if we don't get paid, you know, if this campaign doesn't get funded, we don't get paid. So for all of those things, we feel that this is the most streamlined um, solution for creators, sort of on the back end, like, you know, your users, your backers are not going to see all of this stuff, but it's going to make a, a world of difference to you um, going forward. That being said, I'm going to let Eric discuss some of those forward-facing, user-facing differences that we have with Zoop that you don't see on, say, Indiegogo or Kickstarter. Yeah, um, one thing that is, you know we've come out of the gate with so far is the curated nature of the site. Um, you know, uh, if you've got a campaign, uh, you're going to be amongst um, people that are that are you know have been out there in the in the marketplace. They're they're you know they have high visibility. You're you're going to be enjoying a nice placement among them. Um, we're looking for professional. People, people that that handle their business and, and get things done, and they have uh, you know good following. Um, these are things that uh, you know we can be reaching out to uh, creators, or they can come to us, either or. But there is no kind of barrier. There is um, you know really just standard type stuff. We don't want in you know insulting type material, things that are going to um, you know ruffle people's feathers in 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 extreme ways um but really we're looking for different voices different types of uh, categories different creators to come to the platform and be a part of that vision so in putting these things together we we, we present these creators with um things that are differentiators things that we take a little different approach to um there is an a la carte kind of checkout system where you can choose as many items and you know as many as many copies of those items as you want, uh, as opposed to the tiers that you will see typically on other platforms. So for the, for the consumer, for the supporter, um, they'll create their own checkout. They'll create their own th things, just picking and choosing from amongst rewards, amongst add-ons, which are unlocked once you get a reward. That's how we set things up. And it could be any kind of arrangement. We have, we're totally flexible in the way we could set up a campaign like that. But one thing we found is with our first few campaigns that um, it's really causing supporters to get, uh, I guess, creative in their combinations so much so that they'll spend a hundred dollars a pop um, as opposed to just being given a tier of 40 or a tier of 60 or a tier. They'll just pick and choose. And before you know it, their cart is filled with all these items that they specifically need and want uh, and, it's it's pretty striking how how quick how how those totals really fill up. Um, so you know maybe we're uh, growing in our visibility, so we don't have um, quite the thousands of supporters per campaign yet. But those few hundred that are on these campaigns currently are spending hundreds of dollars. <laughs> so it's an interesting model and one that will continue to grow as we get into the thousands of supporters. Um, to see how they will be filling up their carts with multiple items. And Eric, um, Eric on, yeah. on that, on that add-ons thing. Uh, so for those people who are listening, you know, typically like Eric mentioned, like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, they have tiers, right? As a user, as a supporter or backer, you're allowed to select one of those tiers and that's it. Now for creators, in order to potentially sell more product to that same user, you'll then go to a secondary company like a backer kit or a crowd ox. And what that does is, you know, those services will reach back out to all of your backers and say, Hey, thank you for supporting the campaign. Was there anything else that you wanted to purchase? Right? So if, if I'm someone and I bought one tier, but there were items in another tier that I wanted, I'm kind of out of luck unless I kind of, you know, sign in with a different account to purchase, to make multiple purchases. So utilizing these secondary, um, these secondary companies like a backer kit, for example, now as, as, 
as the creator, now you have to take all your information from Kickstarter, export it from Kickstarter, import it into the, ba the backer kit backends. You're giving backer kit a percentage of all your sales. And now you have multiple methods, you know, which is a good and a bad thing uh, to communicate with your audience. But it, it's just another layer and it's another month long campaign that you have to run through backer kit with us because it's just basically like going to Amazon and putting everything in your cart and checking out you know, we do away with the, it, all that need, all the extra effort, all the extra work and that extra month basically of a campaign. So it, it's something that we feel is just like more streamlined and intuitive, not only for creators, but for backers as well. Like, I mean, isn't it weird that we're kind of like trained to think, oh, it's normal to just be limited to one thing that you want, but then going to literally any other e-commerce website, you're like, I'll take all this stuff that I want and, and, and just so purchase it. As, as I want to. So that's the model that we're really bringing and thinking that it, it's much more streamlined and, and intuitive for everybody involved. And, and we're focusing on flexibility and being nimble and working with a creator to, um, I guess, to situate things in a way like we've had a bunch of commissions as rewards and add-ons where typically you know, you're used to having it as part of a tier, you will get a commission. Okay, let's talk afterwards and figure out what that commission should be. Or we have pre-made um, works that we want to put up. These are all things that we can just put in uh, add-ons and just one by one, they can be selected um, as, you know, something that everyone can add to their carts as opposed to having to create numerous tiers it's just this really long time consuming thing where you'd have to have, you know, 20, 30 tiers at the end of the day. Ours is more like we've got a few rewards and then we've just got a whole bunch of scattered other options that um, the commissions can come in um, one by one. Um, so really the, the being nimble is a focus. We're, er we're young enough that we can kind of adapt and create our own rules in certain scenarios where we, um, um, we can offer items from, from the creator's back catalog. We can extend campaigns. We can move um, items around into, you know, rewards, add-ons on the fly. We could change uh, the pricing. We can, you know, just upon demand, we can kind of gauge things and, and make those changes um, for you. Um, we could even, um, let's say, open a campaign back up if it's been closed, if there's a, you know, a need. The, these are... This is the type of nimbleness that, you know, other platforms would never dream of because they're set in their ways. If they do it for one, they've got to do it for all. <laughs> so we're, we're, you know, we're new and we're, uh, you know, we, we, we create opportunities on the fly. Um, we can come up with, um, let's say, other payment methods, other things that can kind of be done after the fact to collect those kind of delinquent uh, credit card, you know, transactions after the fact. Um, so these are all things where, you know, you, you can kind of see that kind of personal touch uh, with the creators um, that we work on. Um, retailer is another big thing, uh, depending on the, the client, they might have a heavy retailer focus. We'll, we can do a lot of that outreach. Um, what else? Yeah, I think you know, this. Yeah, this, I, I mean, uh, I, I think. I was gonna say, I think we covered a lot. I mean, it, you know, this might be eye-opening to some people who, have, who haven't really thought about all this stuff, but when you start up and break it down, you're like, oh yeah, there are a lot of holes currently in crowdfunding. And, and it would be nice to kind of update the process from 2009 when, when this kind of all came to market. That's kind of the goal. You know, we're trying to make it easier for creators to bring projects to life. We're trying to make it easier for backers to support those campaigns. Um, you know, there's a lot of great information on how to run those campaigns from Jake and Tom. That's not the information that we're sharing because technically we would be running the campaign for a creator. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're happy with the opportunity to, you know, discuss Zoop, discuss other alternatives and options that are available to people who are looking into crowdfunding. And, you know, thank you guys for listening and for having us today. Well, certainly there's there's pros and cons to both, right? So if you do a digital only product, uh, there's no shipping costs. 
<laughs> it's very easy to fulfill those, which is great. But, uh, you know, it's like, I think people still love to hold printed things in their hands. And uh, the world hasn't quite switched to what to reading absolutely everything and enjoying, especially comics on, uh, on a digital platform. So, uh, you know, we really wanted to do a printed thing, but um, it is going to take us an enormous amount of time and, uh, uh, and, and work to fulfill that. So I don't, you know, I don't know if, if uh, one trumps the other as far as, you know, sales or, or whatever, I guess a lot of it would depend on your, the type of work, you know, that you're, that you're, um, that you're trying to produce, you know? So if you've got something that just looks gorgeous on the page, um, boy, having a printed version is something that is probably going to um, facilitate a lot of sales. If it's, you know, just kind of um, one panel gag things or or something that's a shorter format type of thing, maybe, maybe the digital way to, is the way to go. But I think it's just up to your personal preference and how deep you want to dive into the, the, the printed, part of it because you have to print it you have to find a printer you have there's a lot of work uh involved in producing a printed product and uh and shipping it out so um you know if you want to if you want to do all that legwork and and then printed a printed piece is a great thing if if it's not something that you want to do then maybe just go digital and, and see how it goes i think that going digital potentially limits um what you can do for rewards and add-ons right you can't sign something digitally um you can't really you know do like a sketch on something digitally and then if you wanted to add maybe like a pin or a print or a t-shirt or something now all of a sudden you're getting into physical product anyway um but there are campaigns that do just you know straight digital um i would set your your goal lower uh understanding that maybe your price point for your item might be a little bit lower because it is digital there's no fulfillment costs there's no printing costs um, but with a lower price point, you know, again, lower that goal because you're going to need a lot more people, uh, to come in and, you know, at five bucks a head or 10 bucks a head, as opposed to potentially 25 or $50 a head, uh, with all the other items that you could potentially put on top of your like base, uh, you know, printed comic, for example. Uh, when, whenever I'm doing a Kickstarter, I am <clears throat> like hard baking all the add-ons in the front. So when I'm asking for that initial amount of money, I'm also planning on printing, you know, a thousand bookmarks, a thousand stickers and a thousand mini prints or postcards or something to go with it. Um, so that when it funds, I know I've got enough money for these, these bonus items and my bonus items are always, or my add-ons are always something small that will fit in that same box. So I don't have to get a bigger box or a heavier box. So it's usually just something flat. If I do a print, it's not gonna be bigger than the book. So I don't have to fold it or anything. You can just slide it right in there with it. Um, and then it's a way that you can really offer more value for what they're paying for upfront. And really for me with the Kickstarter is I'm not trying to just sell the books at the Kickstarter. I'm like Tom says, I'm ordering a thousand extra books that I'm going to sell on cons. I'm going to sell on my website. Um, so to kind of give people an incentive to back a Kickstarter, I don't mind putting all this extra stuff in the beginning or in the, in the front of it, uh, it um, and, and making a little bit less money up front, knowing that I'm going to make so much more on the back end selling these things over time. Um, aside from like logistically figuring out how to provide an NFT for someone who's paying through a crowdfunding app, because typically you have to go through a platform that, that mints NFTs aside from, Figuring out that, um, I would just tread lightly because it's really controversial in the in a lot of these art communities um, whether or not these things are something people should be you know dipping their toe in or not. Um, I, you know, I posted on on Instagram that I was thinking of doing an NFT. I found this uh, uh, platform that is carbon neutral. So it answers like the environmental thing it's artist centered. And then, you know, they, 
they, you know, it had all these, these red flags that I had, it sort of dealt with all those, but still there was a massive amount of backlash and unfollows and things like that. So it's really hot. And maybe if you want to be on that front line of like, um, being, you know, you know, being the advocate for an NFTs, go for it. If you want to just hang back until everyone catches up someday, then maybe you do that. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, like before the, the initial backlash, you know, mm-hmm. that Jake was discussing, I, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be the hottest thing. Cause at that point, you know, you had your people who's selling like $69 million and, and all this crazy stuff is happening. I'm like, oh my God, we have to capitalize. And then, you know, the, the worries, uh, um, the ecological impact and, and the carbon footprint. And so we took a step back. Um, we are set up and Jake, to your point, we have a solution for, you know, that like pre-order, how do you do it? But the, the piece that's sort of missing still, regardless of how people feel about uh, NFTs is the recipient also needs to have their own wallet. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I don't know that an individual crowdfunding campaign or even our our platform wants to educate, you know, a user who's never who's never purchased an NFT before. And is like, oh, I could get this because, you know, it's not they're not dropping six at four fifty five p.m. And I have to be there at that exact mm-hmm. time to get it. You know, the, the, it, crowdfunding could potentially give an opportunity to people to, to purchase their first NFT. But there's also the education about like, all right, now you need a crypto wallet. What does that mean? A lot mm-hmm. of people don't know. So that when, when it comes time to potentially fulfill that NFT, there may be a little gap in the education on, on the backer side of things. And that's not disparaging by any means. Like NFTs are still very new. And despite the outrage and people hearing about it, they may not know how to actually receive one. So mm-hmm. for that reason, I think we're still a little early in it becoming like a sort of like a mainstream perk for, for crowdfunding. I can see it happening in the in the near future for sure. Right now, though, to, to Jake's point, uh, I don't think we're ready to be on the front lines of that yet. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I guess um, you just have to get over that, right? I mean, as a creator, and you're trying to sell a product, you're that's that's your number one thing is asking people to buy your product. So my biggest concern with our crowdfunding thing wasn't because I thought we were going to struggle to be able to produce this thing. I knew we were going to be able to do it. Uh, A lot of it, um, I thought I found some people were more nervous about the fact that uh, you got to do everything else. I mean, the, (laughs) the drawing and the writing and the creating it obviously does and I can do that. Uh, MAD and DC did all the other stuff for us. So how how are we going to convince people that we're going to be able to handle that part of it? Well, fortunately, about uh, going on 10 years ago now, I self-published a How to Draw Caricatures book that is um, uh, currently in its 10th printing, actually. And uh, so I have a long track record of working with printers and, you know, being able to publish and get a printed product out and be able to go through all the logistics of all that. So I think we had a little bit of a, of a an advantage there that we were able to say, look, we've, you know, produced 30,000 copies of this self-published book already. And uh, I think we can handle this print job. Um, but boy, you know, I just, I can totally understand being very, apprehensive about putting yourself out there and saying, please give me money. I mean, a lot of people think crowdfunding is, is, you know, kind of like panhandling, but it isn't your, your offering to create a product and you need to show the, you know, the audience that you're capable of, of doing it and then let, let them decide if, if they want to support you or not. Um, and so that's ultimately, no matter what you do, you you can't pry open people's wallets. They they will back you and fund you if they feel that they can they can trust you and they have confidence in you to do that stuff. And you just have to let them make that decision. I guess that's great advice. That's, that's really great. And advice. I might add, um, and I, I, I yeah, yeah, Eric. Yeah. For all the creators that are maybe a little gun shy or are not really sales people. Um, 
come to a platform that'll do all that for you and you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to worry uh, so much about that and we can kind of shape and mold that message for you we have a head of marketing that does exactly that with all of uh, all of the messaging so really you know you can kind of distance yourself a little bit if you uh, have someone else that is uh, more seasoned uh, so that's another option as well uh, Jordan Jake Eric Tom thank you so much thank you, thank you. All Thanks. right. Have a great day, guys. You too. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.